Hi everyone, it's Lizzie here. I hope you're all healthy and well at the moment. Today I'm going to be talking about goal setting. I'm going to share some of my insights from my journey as an Olympic athlete. Goals are important to all of us, but they're probably even more relevant whilst we're navigating the changing landscape that we find ourselves in currently. This video will hopefully be helpful for anyone wanting to improve their goal setting strategy at any time, but will give some extra guidance on what to do if your aspirations for the month or for the year have had to shift because of COVID-19. Before we get going, a really big thank you to Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management and to Teamed Up for encouraging us all to explore how we can improve our physical and mental well-being during these challenging times. Goal setting is one of the most common exercises for athletes at both a junior and a senior level. Whether it's qualifying for the county championships or winning an Olympic medal, the majority of athletes will have aspirations and objectives for the season ahead. Goal setting is obviously used in business too, though it may well be called something different. KPI tracking, objectives, targets, performance planning, etc, etc. Many people will also have personal goals, whether that's running a marathon, losing some weight or improving a relationship with a loved one. Quite simply, a goal is an ambition for an outcome, a vision for the future, something that we're aiming towards. Now, goals are obviously incredibly important. They give us that long term vision and direction and the short term motivation to take action. But I think that goal setting can actually be a really misunderstood practice, even in sport. Many people believe that setting a goal to achieve an ambitious dream and then working hard is all it takes to achieve the vision. They believe that the difference between those who eventually make it and those who fall short is probably just a matter of luck, timing or inherent talent. This may be true in some cases, but I think there are a few more steps and tactics involved if you're interested in giving yourself the best possible chance of actually achieving your goals. The reality is that most of us need to change our behaviour in order to change our trajectory towards a challenging goal. This is a bit less simple than writing an ambition down on a piece of paper and simply hoping for the best. For example, if you currently don't do any exercise, but your goal is to run a 10k, then you're going to need a, pre a pretty significant shift in behaviour for exercise to become part of your routine. Makes sense. If you're uncomfortable standing up and speaking in front of people, then again, you're going to need to shift your mindset and behaviour if your dream job is to run your own company one day. The way that I like to look at it is that it isn't always the tallest or strongest athlete in the race that wins. I definitely wasn't the tallest or strongest in most of mine. It isn't always the person with the highest IQ in the room who becomes the most successful or becomes the household name. But it is the people in any industry who have a set of systems and habits and behaviours that makes success inevitable. It's pretty simple. Our habits dictate our ability to get stuff done and our ability to get stuff done dictates our ultimate success and whether or not we achieve our goals. So let's take a look at how we go about behavioural change. There are three ways that we can think about behavioural change and setting ourselves goals. We can focus on outcomes, I want to achieve X, Y, Z, we can focus on processes, these are the steps that I need to take in order to achieve X, Y, Z. Or we can focus on identity, this is who I need to be in order to achieve X, Y, Z. The majority of traditional goal setting is outcome focused. I want this result, I want to win this medal, I want to get this promotion, I want to lose this amount of weight. But there's a really big problem with goals that focus only on outcome. And that problem is all to do with dopamine. Dopamine is our feel-good hormone and it drives pretty much everything that we humans do that makes us feel good. So grabbing a burger, going for a drink with our mates, online shopping, checking our Instagram likes, all of these things make us feel good and are driven by dopamine. Our reliance on dopamine is a modern manifestation of a primal response that kept us alive thousands of years ago. We had to feel good about things like food because it was in incredibly important for us to be incentivized to remember exactly where that food came from. We needed to feel good around people because the protection of numbers was so critical to our survival. So our dopamine response is normal and it's automated. But in modern day times, it isn't always helpful. When we're trying to change our behavior, we also re rely on this dopamine response to keep on track, to maintain momentum and motivation. The way that we get our little hit of dopamine in this context is to see that we've made progress towards our goal. 
So when we jump on the scales and we see that our weight has gone down, or when we go to the gym and receive evidence that we've become stronger, we feel a little rush of confidence and satisfaction from dopamine. The problem is that when it comes to significant behavioral change, we don't usually see tangible results straight away. In fact, we often have to reach some kind of critical threshold before we receive any evidence at all that our hard work is paying off. That doesn't mean that our efforts aren't worthwhile until this point, but it sometimes takes a little while for our investment to cause a noticeable change. This is bad news for our dopamine response. If all we have are these outcome focused goals to sustain us, then it's easy to become disillusioned and lose momentum when we don't see tangible progress towards the result that we want. It's one of the simple reasons why so many of us, myself included, sometimes set really positive New Year's resolutions, feel super motivated to go after them and achieve our goal. And two weeks later, middle of January, we're back to our old habits and behaviours and we've all but given up. A very real example of outcome focused goals that just don't work. Once you've got an idea of what you want to achieve, turn to the behaviours required to enable you to get there. If you're not sure what these are, then think about someone who has already achieved what you're aiming for or has achieved something similar and look at the behaviours that they exhibit. It's very likely that those behaviours played a significant part in enabling their success. Ultimately, what you're doing is deciding the kind of person you want to be rather than just what you want to achieve. There are a couple of different reasons why this works so well. First of all, it plays to our sense of being, of who we are. It's very easy for us to separate ourselves from our actions, but it's much more difficult for us to separate ourselves from our identity. It's far more powerful for you to say, I am a runner, than it is to say, I want to run a 10K. It's far more powerful for you to say, no thanks, I don't want a cigarette, I'm not a smoker, than it is to say, no thanks, I don't want a cigarette, I'm trying really hard to quit. It's a super subtle difference in language, but it makes a really big difference to our application to goals. I actually read somewhere recently that by simply asking kids to be a helper rather than to help tidy up, you can increase the chances of them assisting an adult tidy, tidy after a session of play by 30%. Now, I don't have kids yet, but I would love to hear whether or not this works. The second reason that the identity piece is so strong is that we no longer need that proof of progress in order to maintain momentum. All we have to do is act in accordance with our new identity to get our dopamine hit. Now, it doesn't matter that we aren't getting any tangible or visible results from our five minute run. We still get dopamine because we're acting in line with our new identity as a runner. The third benefit is that it means we're much more likely to stick to our new habit or behaviour once we've reached our goal. Because for every one of us who's given up on their New Year's resolutions, there'll be someone else who has pushed through, has made it to their goal, but then fallen back into their old routines once that box has been ticked. You might have experience of doing this in, in some format, but yo-yo dieting is a really good example. So decide the kind of person that you want to be and then prove it to yourself with small everyday actions. If you'd like to read more on this, then there's a really, really good book called Atomic Habits by James Clear that I really recommend. So this focus on identity and behaviour is arguably even more important right now, whilst we're adjusting to the restrictions in, restrictions in place because of COVID-19. Many of us don't have an arena to test ourselves in this summer, whether that's an office, an interview or a sports stadium or even the local gym. The reality is that the goalposts have shifted pretty significantly for most of us. Whilst your marathon may have been cancelled or your promotion panel postponed, we can still absolutely be working on our behaviours and habits. You might be asking, how does this relate to sport? And absolutely, sport and business are analogous when it comes to being heavily driven by statistics, rankings, targets, in essence, driven by outcomes. But let me share an ex my experience of how integral this was to my career. As a nine year old, I watched the Sydney Olympics on TV and I was so inspired watching those games that I decided right there and then that one day I too would compete for my country and the Olympic Games. Pretty huge outcome focused goal for a nine year old to have, right? But I also decided there and then that I wanted to be an Olympian. And I think it was that decision, that shift in mindset 
that would start to shape my behaviour and actions towards being an elite athlete over the following eight years before I actually made a Games. I didn't get proof of progress age 10 that I was on track for the Olympic Games, but it didn't matter. I was fulfilling a new identity and it was that that kept me going. Sometimes I get asked, why do some athletes make it whilst others don't, even if there isn't a noticeable difference in ability? Well, I think this behaviours piece plays a really, really integral part in that. Even as an elite athlete, this was relevant. The majority of our training is slow, heavy and tired. You're not getting proof of progress every single day that you're going to be a world champion, break a world record. You're getting proof of progress that you're knackered. So what keeps us going? What keeps us motivated? It's because this is who I am. This is what I do. It's such a powerful way of adopting lasting positive behavioural change. So we've got an outcome in mind and we're working on the behaviours required. Now let's take a look at process. With any goal, there will be a process involved in getting there. The idea behind process goals is that if you commit time and effort into mastering the skills that go into a performance, then you're more likely to achieve the desired outcome. This means working on technical skills, tactical objectives or behaviours, attitude and effort, anything that could lead towards your eventual success. So process is all about the systems you need to have in place that will allow you to achieve your goal. This could be anything from ensuring you've got the right footwear for your running race to setting up the operations that run a business. It could be doing a course to develop a necessary skill, lifting weights in the gym to improve your strength or getting to know a team so that you're able to work together more effectively. All of these are examples of processes. Most athletes spend the majority of their training focusing on processes, the small steps that will take them closer to their goal. There are a number of benefits to process goals. When you've broken a goal down into actionable steps, it becomes much less overwhelming to get started. The first step might simply be a conversation with a colleague to gain advice or going online to buy some running shoes. Process goals also make it much easier to assess where you are at any given point, which means you can adapt to challenge and adversity and pivot more effectively if needed. Although we'd all like our trajectory of success to be linear, the reality is that it's usually indirect, filled with ups and downs. Focusing only on an outcome means judging yourself constantly on results, where you are in relation to the end metric. And this is too binary for most people. You're either there or you're not, success or failure. Especially during times of change and disruption like we're currently in, it's easy to become disillusioned when we're not hitting our targets. Focusing on processes, on the other hand, means acknowledging all the progress you've made, even if it didn't materialise into the result that you wanted. It wasn't wasted effort. If you have a number of small process-driven goals, then it's also easier to maintain momentum because you're setting yourself a number of ways to win each day and get that all-important rush of dopamine. When I was an athlete, I had around 60 process goals to choose from on, every, on any given day. 60 ways to make progress and feel good about yourself. It's no wonder athletes are good at maintaining motivation. So to summarise, set aside some time to reassess the current landscape and how your goals fit into that. Although it's frustrating to do so, some goals might need to be adjusted or postponed due to COVID-19. That doesn't mean you can't create new goals and reorientate yourselves towards a new set of objectives. Make sure that you have both working and personal goals. There isn't a hierarchy of importance, so focus on the things that mean the most to you. If someone else, like a boss or a line manager, is setting your goals at work, then make sure you still take ownership of them. This might mean a conversation where you discuss small changes you'd like to make or an advancement on the original suggestion. As I discussed in the motivation video, having autonomy over our goals is incredibly important. So don't hesitate to make them your own wherever you can. Once you've settled on your goals, look next at the set of behaviours you'll need in order to achieve these. Success comes from action and action is driven by our habits. If you have habits that aren't leading you towards success, then you need to take some time to reevaluate and address this. We humans have the capacity to adopt a multitude of identities. Who are you inspired by that has achieved something you want to achieve? Who do you need to be in order to fulfil your role successfully? With the right behaviours in place, you can focus the majority of your time on the systems and processes, the small steps that will drive you towards the outcome that you want. 
Remember, success isn't linear. So don't worry if you have setbacks along the way. Make sure you're reviewing your progress regularly and that you stay agile enough to pivot in a new direction if an unforeseen barrier arises or a new opportunity comes up. My final tip is to share your goals with others. This doesn't have to be publicly on social media, but with a friend, a colleague, a partner or a boss. Sharing goals makes us much more accountable and more likely to commit to achieving them. But having objective insight from another party can also be incredibly valuable as they might spot an opportunity that you've missed or be able to offer advice from their own experience. Another big thank you to Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management and Teamed Up for supporting us all. Good luck with your goal setting going forwards. I'd love to know how you're getting on. And remember, we can do this.